To those who are just joining, welcome to the BWLN Spring Symposium on Women's Rights and Backsliding Democracies. I'm Melissa Murray. I'm a professor at NYU Law, and I am the faculty director of the BWLN. Um, let me first acknowledge uh, some of the admitted students who may be in the room. This is NYU Law's Admitted Students Weekend, so welcome. <laughs> And I will just say, the weather in New York is always like this. <laughs> it's always gorgeous. And we always have conversations like this. Um, that is actually true. The weather part is a lie. Um, but even if you can't find great weather all of the time here in New York at NYU Law, you can always find amazing conversations like the one we just had, like the ones we are about to have. And so again, I can't think of a better place at this moment to be studying law, to be teaching law, and I hope that you all feel that same energy while you're here today. And today's conversation, um, as the kids say, is going to be a banger. Right? <laughs> um, we are really thrilled to have with us today one of the most urgent and necessary voices on questions of reproductive rights, um, Jessica Valenti. Jessica will be well known to many of you. She's been writing about women's rights for almost 20 years now. A long time. It's been a long Showing time. Showing my age, yeah. She is the author of seven books. She founded one of the first feminist blogs, and she has columns at places like The Guardian, The Nation, and she's a frequent contributor to The New York Times. But her latest initiative, again, is perhaps the one that hits closest to home in this moment. She has a website and a substack. Um, my daughter explained to me what a substack was, and I immediately <laughs> signed up for it. Um, but her substack and her website is known as All in Her Head, and it's home to what she calls Abortion Every Day, which is a daily abortion news roundup, which offers comprehensive and breaking coverage of all of the abortion questions that are going on in the United States at the moment. And just this week, yeah. Your substack really got a workout because there was a lot of abortion news that was going on. And so welcome, Jessica. Uh, we have so much to talk about. So much to talk about. <laughs> so much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, let's just start with the elephant in the room. And I yeah. mean that purposely because it is, yeah. I think, a GOP elephant in the room. Pro yeah, probably. There you go. Um, the Mifepristone ruling. So we currently have a situation where a judge in the Amarillo Division of the Northern District of Texas has issued a decision that stays the FDA's approval of mifepristone, which is one of the two drugs in the two drug medication abortion protocol that was approved 23 years ago. Right. So weirdly, this objection to the FDA's processes was not lodged 23 years ago. It was just lodged this year by a coalition of anti-abortion groups that are now known as the Coalition for Hippocratic Medicine. And they argue that the FDA did not take the appropriate steps in approving mifepristone all the way back in, 20, in 2000. Yeah. Um, and Judge Kaczmarek in the Amarillo Division has agreed with them and has issued a stay uh, that will elapse today. And yeah. if we don't have more discussion, another ruling, it is very likely that access to mifepristone throughout the United States will be over by yeah. midnight. Here in New York. Tonight, here, here in New York as well. Yeah. Um, there's another competing ruling from Judge Rice in the Western District of Washington that requires the FDA to continue the status quo, making mifepristone available to those in a number of blue states which have filed a similar have filed a challenge of their own to maintain mifepristone access. We have governors in states like California and Massachusetts stockpiling both mifepristone mm -hmm. and misoprostol, the second drug in that two drug protocol. This feels chaotic. That's the word I was just going to use. Okay. It, it is chaos. Is it chaotic by design? Yes, it's deliberately chaotic. That is the point. The point is to sow so much chaos and so much uncertainty that even in places where abortion is legal or abortion medication is legal, people don't know. Women don't know if they can get the care um, that they need and are legally entitled to. Doctors will be afraid. Pharmacists will be afraid. And because this is changing so quickly, that just feeds into that chaos, right? And it's it's always been the hope. And they've been successful, right? Like we are in the middle of this extremely chaotic, uncertain moment. Right. So even if we have not affected a nationwide ban mm -hmm. on mifepristone, we have at least sowed an environment in which 
pharmacists and physicians are reluctant to use this drug because they don't know what the legal landscape is. And that can be as right. effective a deterrent as an outright ban. Right. And that was already the case pre row right? Even before Dobbs, you had extremist pharmacists, you had different policies uh, but with different doctors. And so that was already the case. And so that has just increased all of that fear, all of that uh, uncertainty exponentially. And the point always was to make it impossible for anyone to get abortion care, right? By any means necessary. And that is what they're doing. So I'm confused, though. Because me too. It, well, <laughs> here's what confuses me. Um, the Supreme Court in June of 2022 issued its much anticipated decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And in that decision, which upheld by a six to three vote, a Mississippi law that banned abortion at just 15 weeks, and by a five to four vote overruled both Planned Parenthood versus Casey and Roe versus Wade, the court insisted that its decision did no more than return the fraught and vexed question of abortion to the democratic process and to the people who were rightfully the ones to decide this question. Mm -hmm. So is Judge Kaczmarek the people? <laughs> Apparently, appear, I mean, listen, we always knew, and I feel like I can, I, we always knew this was bullshit, right? We always knew that it was never spicy, about- Spicy, very spicy. I mean, we're in, a, we're in a room where I could say that. We always knew that that was the case, that it was never about states' rights. It was always about banning abortion um, in every single state, in every possible way that they could. And I think like what has been really frustrating to me on a personal level these last couple of months with this particular case and because Merrick's ruling, is this idea that they're doing something for women's health, that they're protecting us, right? Um, it just adds salt to the wound. It just makes me like a little bit more furious um, than usual because it's so offensive, it's so insulting, and it's so obviously false. So what Jessica is referring to is, again, the yeah. Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine mm -hmm. is arguing that mifepristone is unsafe for women, despite the FDA's approval that has been in place for over 20 years. Um, she notes all of this, and again, the sort of um, ignominy of, of, of casting this in the lens of women's health mm. in one of your really powerful columns from mm. April 7th, which you titled, The Men Who Ruin Us. Mm. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Worth, worth clapping for, it's, it's a great title. Can we, like, what is this about, right? Um, is this a backlash to women's progress? Is this an effort to put us back into particular boxes? I mean, the women's rights movement has been in place since mm -hmm. the 1970s. Ruth Bader yeah. Ginsburg helped to read women into the Equal Protection Clause. Abortion rights is only part of that. Is, are yeah. we, again, and this is the question the symposium asks, yeah. is there more to come and how will we as women mm -hmm. fit into a society that purports to be democratic without necessarily taking into account the voices of women? Yeah, just a small question. Um, yeah, it is opportunism and it is punishment, right? And that's sort of what I tried to get at in this column. I think so much of this is about punishment. I don't think... It is a coincidence that they went after abortion medication specifically, right? Abortion medication completely changed the way that people were able to get abortion care. You can have an abortion in your home watching Netflix, right, privately. Um, I wrote this in the column, but it's true. We took away their ability to publicly shame us at clinics, right? Um, that made them angry. They don't want abortion to be easy and safe. And that is, you know, part of like the big hypocrisy there, right? Like them talking about this in this in this case, as if this was about women's health, as if this was about protecting women. Women are not safer or healthier as a result of this ruling. Um, and they certainly will not be going forward. And we've already seen that um, in states with abortion bans, all of these horror stories coming out. And so it is very clear to me that this is about punishment. Right, so punishing women, but for what? What are we doing? <laughs> that's the, that's the big question existing um having having our own lives and making our own decisions right and i think with abortion specifically that is very much you controlling your body you controlling the trajectory of your life mm -hmm. of your family and to a certain group of people to unfortunately a large group of people that's not okay um and i i really do think that it gets back to that i think i believe that 
it's at the heart of it. So, so let, let's connect some of the dots. Yeah. Um, I, I guess it was maybe two years ago, there was a baby shortage formula. And th this was a big issue, the, like there, there wasn't enough baby formula available on the market. And there's all of this discussion about what could be done. And one of the things the Biden administration wanted to do is pass a bill that would provide more money to manufacturers so that they could basically increase productivity and, mm -hmm. and put more supply into the market. Um, and, and this was met with objections from a number mm -hmm. of Republican legislators. And one of the more interesting arguments against flooding the market with baby formula or subsidizing the production of baby formula was that women could actually breastfeed. And if women would just breastfeed, we wouldn't have this problem anyway. So we, there was no need to flood the market with more supply. There was no need to subsidize the supply. Women could do this themselves. Um, so, so that's just one marker. And you know, it sort of passed as like, you know, those crazy guys in Congress saying crazy guy stuff in Congress, and right. no one thought about it. Right. But when you think about it now, in the, with the backdrop of what is happening with reproductive rights, it seems even more compelling that like this is not necessarily about mifepristone it's not about abortion it's not about baby formula it's about this sort of natural role of yes. women to be mothers yes and that the idea of a woman avoiding that mm -hmm. or determining it on her own terms that's the problem yeah i'm so glad i'm so glad that you brought that up and i actually didn't know that about like the breastfeeding but that makes total complete sense right it's about reinforcing traditional gender roles and by the way, also reinforcing um, the traditional gender binary, right? It is not a coincidence that we are seeing all of these attacks on abortion at the same time that we're seeing attacks on trans rights. And they are literally completely interconnected. And we are seeing that in the attacks, the way that they are messaging the attacks, right? Like, so in Ohio, where they're pushing a pro-choice ballot measure, um, the anti-choice group who is fighting against it is spending millions of dollars on a campaign on TV ads saying, if you vote for this pro-choice ballot measure, it is going to allow your young teenage minor daughters to have sex change operations. And, and that's their language, not mine. Um, they know that these issues are connected, mm -hmm. right? The question is, will the reproductive rights movement understand that as well and really take that to heart and make sure that, that as we're fighting the good fight, that we have that at the center also. All right, so I definitely understand the connections yeah. with the anti-trans work that we've seen proliferating around the country. Is there a connection between other assaults on individual civil rights? I, I'd call them access to knowledge. I mean, mm. we're seeing libraries being defunded in mm -hmm. places like Missouri. Uh, Florida apparently can't teach history at all. Um, are those connected to this? Like, like yeah. is, what's the connection that yeah. undergirds all of this? I mean, it is that access to knowledge, right? Like, let's take Florida, for example, right? In Florida, please take Florida. I, please, like, <laughs> take it, have it, you can have it. Um, you know, Ron DeSantis just signed that, that six week ban overnight, like a total coward. Um, and the, the six week ban, so already you have like no access, right? Zero access. Then you have a state where the libraries are empty. You don't have information at students' hands. Then you have bills that they're trying to pass that um, strips away all sex education, right? Any, any sort of mention of contraception or how your bodies work. They were trying to push something that said, you can't teach about periods. You can't have girls know about how periods work. Um, before high school. And so you have a state where there's girls don't know about their periods unless they're learning at home. You have no comprehensive sex education. You have a, a, a basically what amounts to a complete abortion ban. And then all of a sudden you're gonna have a lot of young girls giving birth. And then add on top of that, the way that they are overfunding these crisis pregnancy centers, which have relationships to evangelical Christian adoption organizations, private adoption organizations, it's all connected. We're going to see a lot of young girls getting pregnant and having their babies taken away from them, honestly. And this is something I've been writing about a lot too. I know it's like a, a bit of a tangent, but I do think it's important. Um, in multiple states in places like Tennessee and Alabama, they are trying to streamline the adoption process. They are trying to make it easier to terminate parental rights. 
Um, we know whose children will be taken away from them, and we know where those children will go. And, and this is why I was so grateful that when I came in, I wasn't here all day, but there was a conversation about reproductive justice, right? Like this is all connected to that as well. Um, and so it's not just one thing, it's a million things. And that also feeds into the chaos, right? So it feels like everything is on fire. Yeah, correct. Um, and, and that's possibly by design. We also saw last week the expulsion of two state legislators from the Tennessee State House. Um, they were protesting against gun violence and protesting against the state legislature's refusal to undertake steps toward meaningful gun reform. Um, there were actually three of them. Um, only two were expelled. <laughs> Um, hmm. the, one of them was not <laughs> expelled by a margin of one vote, um, Gloria Johnson. What was interesting to me about this was that um, for both of the two young black men who were expelled, the votes were incredibly lopsided. Um, for Justin Johnson, or Justin Jones, excuse me, the vote was 72 to 25, which suggests yeah. not just um, an antipathy for the protests, but also perhaps the effects of gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's connect all of this up. Um, Loretta Young, who I think is one of the most stalwart leaders of the reproductive justice movement, has said abortion is not a moral issue. It's a gerrymandered issue. Right. Yeah. Can we can you say more about why that is the case? I mean, yeah, it's it's such a big part. I mean, to me, the connection, in addition, they're doing this for all sorts of reasons. But at the heart of it is that they know abortion rights are extraordinarily popular, right? They know they can't win by letting democracy do its thing. And we've seen that, right? I mean, we, yeah. we saw in the wake of Dobbs where voters had the opportunity to directly register their preferences on questions of reproductive rights. They did so overwhelmingly in favor of expanding them mm -hmm. right? even in red states and, and and but the and then the response to that was interesting like mississippi you may not know but i learned mm -hmm. from jessica sub substack um has put in place measures where you can have a direct democracy vote on every issue except abortion <laughs> rights they they re they reinstated I, I think that now it's completely gone, but they were trying to reinstate ballot measures in the state and they said yeah we want to reinstate them except on abortion. Mm -hmm. Literally explicitly said like except on abortion so they're being so blatant and explicit mm -hmm. about it, they, they just don't care they don't care about what voters want. Um, they don't care about what is happening to the, the pregnant people in their state who are suffering. And they just don't give a shit. And, it, and I think that is what is so hard to watch, um, sort of on the ground and seeing people's stories come out. Um, and that's why I'm so grateful for your work and like the work of people in this room, because I came into this, I don't know anything about the law, right? Like this was not my wheelhouse. Um, but it had to become my wheelhouse very quickly. Um, and that's why I'm so grateful that people like you all are doing this, this sort of work to make things clearer, right? And to try to throw a wrench um, into, into that chaos. And yeah, it's a lot. And I, I think a, a lot of people would love to know from you, from, from everyone, what they can do on that level, right? Like what might they not know that they can do? Um, that, that we can yeah. push them because everyone is looking for something to do everyone you know like people people want to help and I can tell them the stuff that i'm an expert in. But I can tell them the stuff that you're an expert in. You turn this to me, I have like just a little bit just a little bit you're so cagey um, I know well, i'll say one thing um I don't think we can understate the distortive effects of gerrymandering. I'm um, like I, I think gerrymandering was part of what explained what happened in Tennessee last week. Uh, I think it explains the extreme nature of abortion bans that are being passed, like just last night in Florida, like six weeks. Um, that's the result of gerrymandering. You just don't get those kinds of extremes mm -hmm. unless you've so distorted the nature of the state legislature so that like there's they don't have to answer to the majority. Yeah. Um, so I mean, the distortive effects, I think, are really profound. We have to grapple with them. And 
because it is so distorted, because the malapportionment is so profound, mm. the only way to overcome it is to literally flood the zone with voters. Right. Like, which means we can't afford to sit out an election, any election. We can't afford not to vote down ballot. And it's really making clear how important every race is like it's not just president and congress although those are massively important because believe me if congress changes hands yeah. and the presidency changes hands we will have a nationwide ban on abortion for sure like and brett kavanaugh would be like but guys yeah. it won't matter yeah it will not matter um but it's the other stuff too like state legislators um sheriffs like the constitutional yes. sheriff movement is just insane we have to pay attention to that school boards state judges like victoria norris is somewhere in the room and she's just been absolutely stalwart on the whole question of like really thinking about state constitutionalism in this moment we just had a tremendous victory in wisconsin where the voters voted for yes judge janet Pertasowicz. um who ran on an explicitly yep. pro-choice pro-choice platform mm -hmm. she said you know J judge janet pro-choice pro-democracy yep. pro tasowitz i'm like yes. exactly amazing <laughs> good for you <laughs> I, and, and we won there um but then there was also down the ballot a special election in one district in wisconsin where control of that mm -hmm. seat was really the sort of test for control of the whole majority and without that majority the democrats could not stave off the republicans trying to impeach judges and justices that were doing things that they don't like and as soon as that seat was won they started talking about yep. impeaching judge janet and yep. she hasn't done anything yet <laughs> like she literally hasn't done anything yeah All right so okay so again we have to run the tables like and I think the youth yeah. vote is just so extraordinary here I mean if you are a young person mm -hmm. under 21 keep your eye on the ball because yeah. they are trying to keep you from voting like they're yeah. trying to limit the opportunity to vote on college campuses uh, they are trying to redistrict in ways that cut the power of enclaves where college students live that is by design yeah that is by design so keep your eye on the ball and watch all of that. And, and also think about how you too could become involved in the political process. Mm -hmm. Like you can be in college and be a local selectman or an alder yep. There are lots of ways to be involved and we have to think about all of that too. Um, can I go to another democracy issue? This is not about your sub stack, but it is an no, issue that I think is related. Let me just say one okay, thing go. The, uh, in terms of younger voters. The thing that I like to say to younger voters is that imagine the worst guy you know the biggest asshole in high school the one who constantly interrupted you the person who was like mm, just to play devil's advocate that those are the guys who are making these decisions right like those are the sheriffs those are the district attorneys like the the literal worst guys that you have ever met are the and if that doesn't motivate people i don't know what will because that is what really like lights the fire under my ass so thank i you. immediately yeah. thought of justice alito i was not thinking <laughs> about anyone from high school um sorry no it's good um, i mean well speaking of justice alito um what do we make about this recent news from the court that puts justice thomas in an uncomfortable position of having received millions in private travel and accommodations and lodging from someone who is a very dear friend and has been for 25 years. Um, Justice Thomas has been on the court for about 31 years. Um, very good friend. And now it's been released and disclosed that this friend purchased Justice Thomas's mother's house and has made significant repairs on the home, which I think she mm -hmm. still lives in. How can we connect this dot to everything else? I mean, I think it is. I think it is that worst guy that you know, and it is, they don't care about the rules. They expect you to adhere to rules that they would never put in place for themselves. Um, and they sort of don't care if you know it. I mean, that's what makes me afraid about, you know, the conversation right now about Thomas, like, is anyone gonna care? Are people gonna come out like in force against this? I'm nervous that they won't um, because I'm nervous that we are so used to the corruption that it sort of becomes just another thing that's that's rolling off of our back, right? And I think it 
can't. And, and it's so difficult because I think ev anyone who does this work, everyone in this room, I'm sure, is exhausted, is so tired, is so run down. Um, and so it can be really hard to say everything matters. Every little, every little bit matters, and we have to make a, a big fucking deal about every little thing. Um, because it's exhausting and because that's really that's really hard to do, but that is what it feels like um, right now. Sorry, I'm just like so. I, I actually am really exercised about this. I mean, I, I, yeah. I think this is just beyond the beyond. I mean, does, does anyone remember Abe Fortas? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like none of the, the young people are looking around like, who's Abe Fortas? Yeah, this um, so Abe Fortas was a member of the Supreme Court um, back in the Johnson administration, and he aspired to be Chief Justice. Um, at the time, like lots of members of the court actually engaged in consultancies with various mm -hmm. organizations, including Justice Douglas. Um, but Abe Fortas received money from one of the, I think, like roughly $20,000, which was a lot of money in the 1960s. Um, and because of that very close association, was forced to surrender his seat, to relinquish mm. his seat, leave, resign his seat, and leave the court. And what was interesting about it was that it was not partisan at all. Mm. Like Democrats who recognized that Nixon would fill his seat were like, "Yeah, you gotta go, Abe. You gotta go. This is like this is the appearance of impropriety by itself is enough." What we are getting now is so shocking to me because mm -hmm. it's worse than Abe Fortas, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, even leaving aside the question of whether private jet travel is or is not disclosable, the fact of the real estate sale is clearly yeah. something that needs to be disclosed and was not. And we don't, we're not, there's not a, the, the, the outrage is selective. It's, it's just the liberals who are like, is anyone like thinking that this is wrong? And instead, the other side is like, here's another smear of a great man. Yeah, I mean, it is absolutely astonishing. And, and again, democracy depends on institutions. Mm -hmm. We have to believe the court is legitimate for this to work. And we have a decision from Amarillo where literally the first footnote is a footnote that aspires to fetal personhood. Mm -hmm. And now we have the highest court in the land. We've literally gone from the lowest to the highest where one of the justices appears irreparably compromised mm -hmm. by his associations with big money interests. How are we going to remain a democracy in all of this? I wish I had the answer to that question. Um, I don't know that I can answer that on like a political legal level, but I can say one of the most frustrating things to me about watching all of this go down is just from a, a messaging level, right? Um, this this idea that like oh look another smear campaign on a good man right like we saw that with Kavanaugh we like saw that with Kazmierich right like they all oh, calling him an activist judge any time that conservatives can go back to this idea that this is really about hurting a singular man that is a winning message for them which is so incredibly messed up right that uh, that a singular bad man's reputation is more important than democracy and institutions. Um, and so for me, I that is the messaging that I want to see from liberals and from, mm -hmm. from Democrats, like really just taking that on full on, like not hiding from that, not hiding from the conversation about like smear campaign. Um, and maybe those conversations are happening and, and I'm not seeing them. Um, I, I don't see that. I yeah. don't see them either. I mean, I, I don't understand why we're not talking about this and the condemnation of it is anti-democratic. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm gonna be honest, I don't understand why I don't see a lot of politicians coming out and talking about this, like not just the courts, abortion, abortion medication, like why didn't Biden do a national address when this ruling came down? Yeah. Like to me, like that was so offensive. You were talking, like you were talking- about the State of the Union. Any, oh, the State of the Union, the three sentences, the 30 seconds. It was so offensive. It was so ridiculous. And it just like to me went to show how little um, passion, enthusiasm, motivation he has on this issue. And, but that seems like a losing strategy because mm -hmm. we see abortion is a galvanizing yep. issue among the electorate right now. Yeah. I mean, like Gretchen Whitmer is explicitly running yeah. on a pro choice message. Yeah. And she's winning. And she's winning. And she's winning on it. I don't understand 
why other Democrats don't see this. I don't know if it's fear. I mean, I think in Biden's case, it's like because of his personal feelings about mm-hmm. abortion. Um, but yeah, this is this is a winning message. And you know, I wrote a column recently about like the center on these issues to me is rapidly evaporating. Mm-hmm. Um, and the more of these horror stories that come out, that is only going to be more true. And I would just love to see Democrats talking about abortion with like a full throated, not defense, but offense, like really getting into it and like just leaning away from all of their like careful tiptoey nonsense because it never served us and it's not going to serve us now. Well, can we blame Bill Clinton? I feel like I want to blame Bill Clinton (laughs) for so many things. Sure. I blame Bill Clinton for Hillary not being president. I also blame him for talking about safe, legal, and rare. Yeah, which Hillary did too. Uh, You know, I know. But like, yeah, the the safe, legal, and rare is a problem. And now like the new safe, legal, and rare is the no restrictions, Mm -hmm. right? They went from like, oh, you know, safe, legal, and rare. And now it's like, no, we just want to go back to Roe, right? Democrats are saying, we just want to go back to Roe. That's it. Mm, We're not asking for too much. That's it. Roe wasn't that great. It wasn't that great. Like, look where we are. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is this fear that if they they argue for something more, then Republicans are going to say, look, they want, you know, they want no limits abortion. They want abortion up until the day of birth. Guess what? They're saying that anyway. Yeah. They're saying that anyway everywhere. In Ohio, where they're doing this ballot measure, um, they're doing the same thing. It's like a viability um, threshold. The um, president of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America wrote an op-ed saying, oh, that ballot measure um, wants abortion up until the the day of birth, right? They just lie. They lie or they will throw a different goalpost in the mix, right? Mm -hmm. If it's not viability, then it's like, oh, well, there's fetal pain at 15 weeks, which is not true. Um, And so there is no winning when we frame our message according to their lies. Um, And I just wish that we saw more understanding of that. Let's surface some of the stories that could underwrite a different narrative for progressive lawyering and movement building. Um, Your Substack has talked about the many individuals who have encountered just horrific, horrific stories, episodes in in their fight for health, what what is healthcare. And so we're talking about this as avoiding a pregnancy, but Mm Mufepristone is also used for medica- for managing miscarriages. Mm-hmm. Um, abortion is a therapy for mm-hmm. managing miscarriages. Like, yeah, can you can you tell yeah. us a little bit about some of these women and like just the horror stories that they've sure. experienced? I mean, I think the 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 overarching issue, right, is that conservatives would like us to think that abortion is something different than other reproductive care, right? They are desperate to separate it out, and it's not. It's it's just a part of everything. Well, they're also eager to frame it in terms of women's licentiousness. Like, yes. And Judge Kasmer yes. talks about this in his yeah. opinion. Like, it's I mean, it's very like, listen, hussies, you yeah. will not get this from me. <laughs> yeah. No, that's exactly right. Um, but as we are seeing with with these stories that are coming out of Texas, Idaho, Tennessee, um, that's just not the case. Abortion is used to help terminate um, a, a miscarriage. It's used for all sorts of reasons. And the stories that we are seeing, I mean, and that's a whole other conversation about what stories we choose to platform and what stories we choose to to sort of give a bigger audience to, but we are seeing a lot of stories of wanted pregnancies. Um, and again, this is where the, the idea of this like restriction and oh, if you're not for like a 20 week restriction, you're an extremist. A lot of these stories are definitely past 20 weeks because that's when you see, you know, big fetal abnormalities and big problems happen. And um, you're talking about all of a sudden we live in a country where women could die of sepsis, right? Like it's unbelievable to me. We're talking about Idaho losing half of its OBGYNs and um, maternal fetal specialists where hospitals are literally having to shut down their maternity wards because there's no OBGYN who wants to come and work in Idaho. Um, And you sort of can't blame them. Um, And potatoes aren't gonna deliver those babies. It's. It took me a minute. <laughs> it's an Idaho um, joke. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's what's so hard about it, it is that the stories are never ending. We know that we're only seeing a very small percentage 
um, of what is actually happening, right? Because the, the people who are coming forward, these are people who feel comfortable and safe going to the media, people who feel secure in their communities, right? Like it is a scary, dangerous thing to go public with some of the most personal stuff that has happened to you in your life. Um, and it's and it's just really worrying. And, and the thing I'm also noticing, getting back to whose stories are we sort of platforming, is we know that the people who are most impacted by this are women of color, black women, especially immigrant women, poor women, right? And I think the hope from conservatives is that because those stories don't get told, that we won't notice, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I, I also think that we need to be very mindful of let's tell all of these stories, right? Because this is happening to a very specific population in a very different way um, than it is in other population. But yeah. So, so let's talk about the women of color who yeah. disproportionately bear the brunt of the restrictions on abortion. Mm -hmm. um, in 2019, in a shadow docket decision called Planned Parenthood, Box versus Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky, Justice Clarence Thomas, same guy, um, wrote a concurring opinion. Like the, the court had denied certiorari as to one of the laws that was under challenge um, while disposing of a challenge to another law. Um, but Justice Thomas wrote this separate concurrence in which he chided the majority for refusing to grant cert on the question of one of the laws and said, the law, which was a reason ban, so it prohibited abortion if undertaken for reasons of race or sex selection mm. or because of the diagnosis of a fetal anomaly, uh, the day was coming when the court would have to grapple with whether or not a state could take reasonable protections to prevent abortion from fulfilling its quote unquote eugenic potential. And he could have stopped there, but as I, as my con law students know, Justice Thomas always goes further. Um, and he went on to sort of craft a narrative in which he wove the history of Margaret Sanger and the Planned Parenthood organization and the birth control movement to a history of abortion. And to be very clear, Margaret Sanger has nothing to do with abortion, right? She didn't favor abortion. She's about contraception. Mm -hmm. But he talked about her work with the eugenics movement, which happened. Um, and talks about how she, in league with these eugenicists, cited birth control clinics in Harlem purposely for marketing birth control and family planning and abortion to the Black community for the purpose of stamping out Black reproduction. And it's a very standard narrative, you know, that was that has been echoed in lots of different quarters. Marcus Garvey talked about state-sponsored family planning as genocide. Uh, the Black Panthers talked about it. The Nation of Islam has talked about it. But Justice Thomas was sort of shepherding and husbanding this narrative mm -hmm. into the US reports, into mm -hmm. constitutional law. And to me, it seemed a very explicit attempt to reframe abortion as a technology of racial injustice mm -hmm. and to reframe opposition to abortion as racial justice, as, mm -hmm. as wokeness mm -hmm. almost. Is Justice <laughs> Thomas really the woke one here? <laughs> it's so much of it is projection to me, right? From conservatives when they talk about um, abortion as racism. When you look at how black women are dying, it is not because of access to contraception or abortion. It is because of medical racism, because of doctors' biases, because of lack of care, because of bans, right? Um, and so they are doing their best to project. Um, the other thing, the other piece of this is the criminalization, right? Um, and that is something that they don't want to talk about because they can't talk about it because when you look at who is criminalized for having negative pregnancy outcomes, right? It's overwhelmingly black women, women of color, poor women. Um, and so it is very, very clear which piece of this movement is racist. I remember, I, I don't know if this is still going on, but I wanna say uh, there were, something happened a few years back, there was an organization that was taking out billboards in majority- the Radiance Foundation. Is that what it was? In majority black communities saying, we'll give you $200 to get your tubes tied? Do you know about this? No, okay. The, I was thinking of a different billboard. No, no. <laughs> Gotta love the billboards. All sorts of racist billboards. Yeah. So uh, the billboard I was thinking of was the one that says the most dangerous place for yes, a black child uh, yes. is in the womb. Yes. 
Yes. This was a, this was a, an organization that was putting up billboards offering um, women money to get sterilized. That's what it was. Thank you. Um, it's so clear to me, right, what that is about. And it's the same thing that I was getting at with um, the adoption piece and the stream, the streamlining of adoption, right? It's about taking children of color out of their homes mm -hmm. and putting them into the homes of evangelical Christians. And um, yes, all connected. And again, like, Justice Thomas said all of this without ever invoking mm. the history of state compulsory sterilization of black women that happened throughout the South, um, the compulsory sterilization of Native women that has happened and may continue to happen on Native reservations. Um, none of this was mentioned, like the racism, the eugenics, the genocide is abortion. Yeah. Um, let me try and connect this up to another dot, like mm -hmm. Justice Thomas is perhaps one of the leaders on the court in reframing issues in terms of racial justice. And very recently, um, indeed just the day before the Dobbs decision was announced, he issued a decision in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, the gun rights case, in which he linked the expansion of the Second Amendment to possibly include public carrying of weapons in places like New York um, to a history in which newly freed African Americans were denied their rights to keep and bear arms and because of the prohibition of arms to these new freedmen, they were unusually susceptible to racialized violence by white southerners and so he's framed this again like the Second Amendment and the expansion of the Second Amendment is framed as an issue of racial justice right just as the withdrawal of fundamental rights for women is a question of racial justice. Fast forward to June of this year, where I'll bet, like, I'll, I'll bet on one of, I'll bet on my dog, whom I love a lot, <laughs> that the court is going to dismantle affirmative action. And they will do so mm -hmm. on the ground that the Equal Protection Clause should be read in a race blind fashion. So let's just think about that as yeah. a, a democratic moment. We are withdrawing fundamental rights. We are expanding gun rights for purposes of racial justice, but we will not interpret the Equal Protection Clause, the one clause in the Constitution that was actually created for the purpose of thinking about race in a way that would accommodate a demand for racial justice for minorities. Where, like, it's it's unbelievable. I'm blown. I did not know about this this gun rights um, decision. That it doesn't surprise me, um, but I, I I I say something a lot where I'm like I'm not surprised, but I still can be shocked, right? Like it's I still find stuff like that shocking. I think something it does go to show though, and we see this um, in abortion rights more generally, is that they obviously understand the power of. The message of racial racial justice right and the power of we've seen this same thing right susan b anthony pro-life america feminists for life right they understand that messages of equality and justice appeal to people because people want that and so the hope is that they can take advantage um well, can i take a beat on that for yeah that? so they understand the power Mm -hmm. of these rhetorical moves, these discursive strategies that make appeals to justice, to equality. Um, I think they also understand the sort of idea that one of the court's roles is to intervene, to protect mm. discrete and insular minorities, like from mm. Caroline products. Um, in the Dobbs opinion, there's footnote 41, which reiterates this logic of abortion mm -hmm. as eugenics. And it's completely bonkers that it's in there yeah. because you don't need it, right? Like the court mm -hmm. did not overrule Roe versus Wade for racial justice. They did so on the ground that the right to an abortion is not deeply rooted in the history or traditions of this country and isn't explicit in the text of the Constitution. So the fact that this footnote exists is entirely right. superfluous. So why is it there? And one answer could be that it's to lay the groundwork for mm -hmm. dismantling the right to contraception. And if you think contraception's not on the table, you're delusional, get on this train, we're, yeah. we're going to the mall. Um, the second thing though, I think could be for the purpose of reframing those reason bans 
not just as abortion restrictions, mm -hmm. but as anti-discrimination measures for the fetus. Yeah. And if you reframe them that way, yeah. then Dobbs is not simply a state-by-state -state settlement of the abortion question, it's laying breadcrumbs for the ultimate showdown, which is mm -hmm. to denominate the fetus a person. Yes and to outlaw abortion entirely. Yeah, we're seeing that in state legislation, right? We're seeing um, language like um, equal protection, you know, for the, for, for the fetus. This And this has come up a lot in bills that have been proposed to uh, criminalize pregnant people and to like in South Carolina to literally have the death penalty for, for abortion. So in a lot of those laws, the justification was um, these fetuses deserve equal protection and should we should also have that be a homicide, right? In the same way that you would mm -hmm. prosecute any other homicide, mm -hmm. that's how you're going to prosecute abortion. Um, and I am definitely seeing that language all over the place. Well, we also saw, so there's a lawsuit that's currently pending in Texas. Um, this was a lawsuit filed by Jonathan Mitchell. If you don't know who Jonathan Mitchell is, mm. he's Elena Kagan referred to him as some genius. Um, he's one of the guys who is the architect of SB8, the Texas bounty hunter law. Um, but he's also representing this husband in Texas who is estranged from his wife. And he is now suing three of his wife, oh, two of his wife's friends and a woman who provided mm -hmm. his now estranged wife um, with medication abortion. And interestingly, they are not being sued under SB8, the bounty hunter law. They're being sued under Texas's wrongful death statute. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, if you're not a law student or you're not a lawyer, wrongful death is available as a civil recovery for those who have been injured because someone else has been negligent in causing the death of someone mm -hmm. that they're close to, like a parent or whatever. Um, but meaningfully, wrongful death statutes are only available for the death of a person. Mm -hmm. And this lawsuit is effectively saying the medication abortion wrongfully caused the death of a person, this fetus, and now I'm seeking a million dollars in damages from each of these women. And he's also suggested to the DA in Galveston that this might also be prosecuted as a homicide. Yep. It's all about personhood, right? Like that is the next goal is to get there's a reason that we are seeing did they lie to us was i mean not just, a state just, by a state just a little bit just a little bit just a little bit there is a reason that in all of these states right republicans are trying to um pass all of these little bills that they are saying will help in this you know post row landscape like um you know you can sue for uh child support if you're pregnant right like your your kid doesn't have to be born you can do it if you're pregnant um it's all, all of these little things that they're doing to establish personhood in those states under the guise of helping women helping families we just want to you know we just want to help everyone acclimate to the new to the new reality like no it's about personhood mm -hmm. they don't they don't give a shit <laughs> they don't care um it's it's really really scary it's a, my my last well not my last my penultimate question mm -hmm. to you like you sort of picked up on this um one of the difficulties of watching anti-abortion discourse in this country is that it's so clearly nested in a web of neoliberalism which mm -hmm. by which i mean in other countries where there are restrictions on reproductive freedom there's also fairly robust support for families so when you know like there's subsidized health care or mm -hmm. socialized health care in some cases um there's some level of subsistence for families um we don't have that so again this idea of compulsory parenthood exists yeah. in a place where we put on the family mm -hmm. the entire burden of mm -hmm. raising and accommodating dependency do you imagine that in this new landscape where compulsory parenthood is on the table that we'll see a shift in our neoliberalism and maybe perhaps a greater solicitude for the idea that there could be more robust state support of families? Maybe a little, I feel like Republicans are being forced a little bit into okay. this, right? Like we've seen a lot of um, expansion for postpartum Medicaid coverage, okay. right? In states uh, with support that you wouldn't expect. And so we're gonna see little things like that. But yeah, it is not the same, forced pregnancy is terrible everywhere but it means something different here right it means something different when you could go bankrupt if you end up with a kid in the NICU right like 
it means something completely different here. And that's why I find it so frustrating. Lots of reasons I find this frustrating um, with the, the language around, oh, it's reasonable to put in like a 15 week ban, a 20 week ban. That's what Europe has. Right, like, and I think that we are going to hear that a lot in the coming months. Like, but we're, you know, look at all these other nations. They're doing. Don't you like those nations? Don't you like those places? They're doing this. People can access abortion in the first trimester much easier there. They have healthcare. That you know, it's just a completely different thing. And so, maybe, maybe we will see a little bit of dismantling of that. Um, I, I think that as much as they can, they will just talk their way around it. Um. Um, one sort of question, again, to go back to this question of democracy. Um, Gazale Moyeti, who is a provider in Texas, told me this story. And like, I've never forgotten it. It's the most arresting story I think I've ever heard. She was telling me that on January 4th of 2021, she went to work at the clinic where she provides abortion care in Texas. And for the first time in months, she could get into the building without incident. Hmm. There was no protesters, no one was there. The patients came in, they got what they needed, they left, no problem. And it was the same on January 5th. Hmm. No one was there, they came in, they went out without incident. And no one could be, what was going on? And so same thing happened the morning of January 6th. And then they're watching TV <laughs> and they're like, wait, isn't that Randy? Oh my God. And, and, and they were literally astonished. They actually yeah. identified their regular protesters, many of their regular protesters who normally would be at the doors of the clinic shouting at patients as they came in, shouting at providers that they were baby mm -hmm. killers. They weren't there because they were at the Capitol. <laughs> <laughs> not not surprising in the least. I mean, even here in New York, right, when you see some of the protesters run clinics in New York, they're proud boys, right? Like the connection between all of those groups, the connection between anti-democratic efforts, white supremacist groups um, and anti-abortion groups, they're all having a great old party together. Like that is that is the deal. Um, and if you have any questions about that, something that I really like to do on TikTok um, is follow clinic escorts and clinic defenders. Mm -hmm. And you can see in these videos exactly who these people are, right? They make it very, very clear um, what what they are all about. So yeah, that doesn't that doesn't surprise me. Well, well and it also suggests there, there are inextricable linkages between mm -hmm. this movement the movement yeah. to suppress voting rights, mm -hmm. the movement to make the democratic process distorted and malapportioned, and the movement to basically run out democratic government in favor mm -hmm. of something that looks more fascistic. Yeah, and the more we can make that connection publicly, I think the better, because something that the anti-choice movement <laughs> has done really well is paint themselves as these like religious grandmas right who are just trying to help someone i'm just trying to talk to her i'm just i'm not harassing oh, the her I'm eleanor just, mccullen yes treatment. they 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 are so good at making this whole thing out to be they just care about women and families you know they've done a great job with their like pro-family messaging and the more that we can make those connections the more that we can connect um th these people to the white supremacist groups to the proud boys to clearly extremist radical groups and the connection that they have to mainstream conservative organizations right as well that's the super yacht and yeah. the private jet yes right the the better off that we will be because so often like doing this work one of the most frustrating things is seeing groups um like students for life for example right how many times have you seen students for life quoted in the media about an abortion story almost every single time i will see a students for life quote um from the president this is a group that wants to ban birth control on their website. They say that hormonal birth control is abortion, right? You never see anyone question them on that when they're um, giving a quote, when they're when they're you know on on TV doing a cable news hit, right? We need to make clear just how radical these people are and what their true goal is, because if we don't, we are allowing them to sell Americans a lie, um, and it just it worries me and it makes me furious. So 
what we have here is a tyranny of the minority. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Like this, there's majority support for abortion rights. Like people may differ about what the scope of those rights should be, but they believe mm -hmm. that the constitution protects this right. And we've seen it in Kansas, yeah. like Kansas, yep. it's not a squishy liberal state, like, no. but they overwhelmingly voted to preserve abortion rights. And I hate to bring it back to like media coverage again, but I, but I will. One of the most frustrating things Americans support abortion rights. Abortion wins elections. Yet again and again, when we see this issue presented in the media, presented like in the public, it is presented as something that Americans are evenly split on, something that Americans are polarized on. We aren't, right? Americans want abortion to be legal. Americans do not want these abortion bans. This is not about mm, America's trying to figure it out and it's this controversial issue. No, it's about a, a few powerful radicals enacting their wills on the majority of Americans. Um, and we need to say that every time there's a New York Times article about it, right? Like, why is there equal column space given? I don't know. I could oh. go on a real rant about this, right, sorry. Well, let's, let's finish this, we have four yeah. minutes. What are five things that everyone in this room can do to make clear the linkages between abortion and democracy and the degree to which there is majority support for reproductive freedom? That is a really, you know, I don't know that I can come up with five. I'll come up with like one big one. Okay. To me, it is talking about this every day. Like we know, all of us in this room know the way that abortion connects to all of these different issues, right? We have the ability to make those connections in our everyday lives, on social media, when we're talking to family, when we're talking to friends, when we're getting out the vote, right? Like we have the ability to bring up abortion everywhere and we should because abortion is everywhere and it is everything and it's connected to everything. Um, and so I know that's not like a, a tangible get out the vote thing. I think plenty of people, you can find that. Um, there is no reason that we shouldn't be talking about this every day and demanding that the people who represent us talk about this mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. with the urgency and importance that it deserves. And so I'll, maybe I'll give some, I, I'm a professor. Yeah, I'm good at giving homework. Um, <laughs> talk about it link it up to these issues that usually remained siloed, right? Like if we're talking about voting rights, we don't get restrictive abortion laws unless we're gerrymandered and we're suppressing those who would object. So they're all connected, they're inextricably connected and we need to talk about them as such. When the New York Times or the Washington Post or whatever tries both sides this, we need to speak up and say, there isn't, the evenness isn't there. There's majority support for this, and we need to talk about that. Um, young people, make voting a habit in every election, in every ticket, like not just the top of the ballot, all the way down the ballot, because down the ballot's where the good stuff happens, where they're, make, where they're making the most inroads, and where we leave, we leave power on the table. Don't leave any power on the table. And then five, I think, Subscribe to Jessica Valenti's oh, That's very nice. <laughs> um, no, truly, Abortion Every Day, it is a fabulous resource which really helps you understand what is happening, how all of these things are connected. Jessica, thank you so much for being thank a voice you. of clarity in chaotic times. Thank it. you.